Um, hopefully lunch was great, at least for me it was pretty much awesome. Um, next up is uh, James Fryman with Event Driven Operations DevOps Next Step. Have fun. Have fun. We're going to have fun, right? Oh, all right. Thank you. I haven't done anything yet, so you know you might want to hold your applause. So quick tidbit of fact. Um, I like to try to make sure that these talks are actually useful for people. And so one of the things that somebody taught me very early on is to try to factor about how much money is being spent on you speaking right now. So I did a quick little recap of how long it takes or how much the average salary for you guys here in Germany is and about how long I'm going to talk. And it comes out to be about $2,500 US. So, or 2,500 Euro, I'm sorry. So I'm hoping that 2,500 euro of words will come out of my mouth. And if it does, please clap at the end. If it doesn't, boo me or come up to after the fact, right? So it's totally cool. So event-driven automations. I think I have to start about what I actually mean about event-driven automations. And this is a very overloaded thing, OK? So what I actually mean about event-driven automations starts with the cultural change that's going to have to happen. And is really a thinly veiled uh, word usage for me to introduce the concept of chat ops to everybody. Uh, so, quick show of hands, who has heard of chat ops? One, two, three, okay, good, four. So this will be a really great conversation. Of the four people that are using chat ops, or just heard of it, are you using it? Anybody using chat ops? Nobody, okay. <laughs> so either, either, either the four people really hate the idea, or I'm gonna encourage you by the end of this talk, if you have not used chat ops, you will never work another way again once you do start. And this is how powerful I think that this talk is going to be. But well, I like to start with um, stories. All of my talks start with stories. I'm a big storyteller. So uh, put, your head in, put, your, put your mind in this headspace for a moment. And, 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 and if this has ever happened to you, kind of just chuckle inside internally. So you're in operations, and you work with computers, and something happens. Maybe you've seen this screen before. And suddenly, you've got to fix this thing, right? And you all get onto this war room, whatever this may be. Maybe it's a, a bridge that you dial into. Maybe you all just shuffle into the, an actual physical room and you know, get all boarded up with pizza coming in constantly to keep feeding you. Whatever, right? So there's this war room going on to fix things. Don't mess with us. Something super critical is happening, right? There's people moving, trying to get service restored. The company's losing money, whatever. And then out of sudden, somebody comes up to you, some VP, and says, hey, how's it going? What's the status? And everything stops. Because you got to give that VP update, right? And so all of the communication that was happening to restore services and all the amount of downtime that you're having associated with trying to restore that service suddenly becomes less important than telling this one person what the status of the, of the downtime is. It's hugely inefficient. Well, chat ops helps with this, okay? Next story. Let's say you're working on this amazing new thing. You're a developer. You have this fantastic new feature you're really excited about. You've been working on it for days, weeks, months, maybe even years if you're in one of those really slowly moving enterprises, and you want to deploy this thing. Well, the first thing that you get brought up with is you got to go to a change control meeting. Ah, uh, okay. So I'm going to go to the change control meeting. I'm going to fill out a bunch of things. Uh-oh. I've got the Kelsey bug. Maybe if I just stop. I didn't get change control approval for this, con this, this uh, talk. Yeah? No? All right, I'm going to just keep trying. So, so you, you fill out these change control approvals, and, and then you have to go to the meetings, and people yell at you, no, we're not going to let that change in. Maybe if I just stand really still. We're not going to let that change in uh, unless you go fill out some more paperwork. So you go fill out that more paperwork, and everything gets approved. You've gone through this process, and suddenly it goes behind the black back door of operations. And you have no idea what happens in here. Right? You hand your code to these people, and you say, please make it run. And they go off into their corner, and they do their thing. And guess what? It fails. You've gone through all of this effort to try to get it out there. You've involved change control people, meetings upon meetings, and developer conversations to try to get your code pushed in, to hand it to this team who you have no idea what happens, only for them to come back and say, it failed. Like this. Chat ops helps with this. Not this, but this. Uh, maybe, maybe you're a new employee, right? 
And the hardest thing about a new employee is onboarding, trying to get that time associated with figuring out how the company works, figuring out what your job is going to be, figuring out how to interface with your team, how to even do the things you've just got hired to do, because it turns out no job is actually the same in a cookie cutter environment. As much as we want to trust, to say, like, if we create all the servers the same way, the next time I go to the next job, it'll be the same, right? No, it doesn't work that way, right? So now there's this onboarding process. And now I've got to go figure out how to efficiently get team members on, how do I get onboarded, well, chat ops helps with that too. And then maybe you're just having a horrible, horrible day because guess what? You work with computers and you just need a picture of a cute kitten. Chat ops also helps with this. So event-driven automations is what I'm going to talk about. It's a larger theme and I think chat ops is part of this. Chat ops is the, what, I'm, what I want to talk about what chat ops is. Chat ops is the cultural change the change that needs to happen within your teams and the change that needs to happen within your organization in order to expose all of this awesome we're working toward, right? It's, it's so much cool that all of us in this room are working on fundamentally changing the world, Silicon Valley style, right? Changing how we do operations by making it easier to do deployments or whatnot. But these are consuming uh, utilities for us. What about the business? What about the rest of the organization that we're actually serving? Right? We lose sight of this often. And this is what I want to talk about with event-driven automations, because with chat ops leads you to the actual end state of Utopia, which is true event-driven automations, where the computer is doing everything. So let's see if I can tell you how we get there. So hi, my name is James Fryman, and I work at a company called Stackstorm. Um, this will not be a sales pitch, I promise. None of the things I'm going to talk about, I will talk specifically about Stackstorm. I may say the name once or twice, um, so don't hold it against me. But basically what we're trying to do is all of the words that are coming out of my mouth, we want to solve this problem. So if you're interested in talking more about what a tool can do, help you with cultural change as well as technology change, come find me afterwards. We'll talk about it. But this won't be about Stackstorm. This will be about chat ops and event-driven automation. So let's talk about it. What is it? Well, first off, chat ops, a term coined by GitHub. So this is where I was first introduced to it. So I used to work for GitHub for about two years. Um, and they coined this term very early on, and it helped them with delegating responsibility and tasks to a bot. And they have a bot called Hubot that they created that they basically used in order to give it simple tasks that were not value-add necessaries for them to do, right? A developer doesn't really want to care about how code gets out to production because I've solved that problem, that's a feature. So why not let somebody, something else go do it? Traditionally, that's a human. Let's go let the ops people go do it. Well, GitHub took a different approach and said, well, let's let a bot do it and see what happens. And it exploded, right? Now, this is not a new concept, right? I don't, who, who has been around in chat rooms since like IRC? Right? Yeah, okay, awesome. Right? You've had bots in there that tell you the weather and get you cool sports stats. But this is like next level stuff here. This is where you actually give the bot some real scary power. And it's interesting to see what happens as a result of that from both a technology and a cultural change. So there's some common tools that are associated with this, and I'll kind of briefly touch on all three of them. How, what's beneficial, which one maybe you should choose if you're going to go down this road. Um, so Hubot is the original. Hubot is written in CoffeeScript. So if you're a CoffeeScript lover, not like me, then that's a wonderful place to go. That's actually a really good place to be because it, now we're coming up with full stack developers, right? A bunch of people coming out of, of school and whatnot, just having known JavaScript. Well, you throw them in front of this and suddenly now they have power to add to this. Great. Maybe you're a Ruby shop and you like Ruby because I like Ruby. And then there's Lita, which is more or less a one-to-one -one replacement uh, of the concepts of Hubot in Ruby. Cool. And then if you ha just happen to be the one of like four places in the world that are Python shops like Stackstorm, there's Ur, right? And Ur is, is again, same concept written in Python. Now, uh, it, when you choose these things, it's real important to understand like ecosystem and community around these. Hubot being the oldest has the largest view of like out of the box plugins to get started with. I, uh, Lita is coming up close second, right? A lot of folks that are ditching the, the CoffeeScript bandwagon r running over to, uh, to Lita. The, the plugin library is being accumulated, not quite as much. So there's a little less functionality. And then Ur is kind of coming up third behind just because, you know, Python. So. Um, where Stackstorm fits into this is we actually sit on top of all of these things. And again, I'll talk about what that means, but we're trying to solve a bigger problem here. I'll come back to that. 
but Stackstorm wants to be the place where all your chat ops needs are served. But why? Can you see that? Why? Well, we've spent so much time talking about all these cool tools today, right? We've talked about Fleet and Console and, and Terraform. Well, if you noticed, right, all of the, you know, especially in the last demonstration, which was fantastic, there was a console associated with that, right? Well, what happens today when you want to show somebody is, hey, come up to my screen, right? Come up to me and sit next to me. Or let's jump on this web thing and you can stare at my console, right? And that's how you pair program program as a developer or a sysadmin, you know, watch me do these things on this, on this command line, and then you go replicate them. Well, that's good and bad, right? The bad part is, is that when you go give a task to somebody and say, hey, I need this done, they go off into a corner, and you have no idea what happens. Well, ChatOps wants to try to change this, and instead of executing the commands that you would normally execute on a command line, now you have a shared console, a shared command line. So when somebody executes something in the context of a chat ops command, you see it, I see it, everybody in the organization sees it. Uber transparency, right? Like, so if that's your key, making sure that people can collaborate and communicate, this is huge. Having some shared place where folks can execute commands and get the response and feedback right away. There's no waiting for the ops guy to come back and say, it didn't work. You're going to know pretty quickly, right? Hey, it didn't work. Right? And so will the ops guy. And you both have the context about this. And that's the key. Right? All of these things we're talking about in order to make our lives better. Deploying faster, selfs, you know, all of these things. Mean nothing if we speed up the computers and don't speed us up. Right? We as humans still have to jump into this and define the business process. Define the business logic that these computers are going to go execute. So, Having a shared context in a place where everybody can see it, everybody can execute it, and everybody can respond to it speeds that up. That feedback loop of emails and meetings and change control and phone calls, whatever those may be, they disappear because that feedback loop happens instantaneously. And here's an example of this. Um, I'm actually going to try some live chat ops here after a bit. We're going to cross our fingers and hope that the demo gods are with us today. Um, but like, this is a real-world example where, at GitHub, um, we would do performance analysis all the time. Right? How fast is the website running? Uh, how many requests are coming in? Are we receiving errors? Whatever that may be. And if you're doing ops well, and you're doing dev well, you're stuffing everything you possibly can into a time series database. Right? And what we did is we went and used our command, our chat ops, to go query that time series database. In this instance, it was Graphite. And we would drop that information into chat. Now, why this is interesting is because imagine a failure scenario. Okay? You're in that scenario where, where everything's broken and everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. Okay? Well, instead of somebody you know, waiting and going into IO wait, trying to do some research on the back end and then coming on to whatever your shared context is, your, your physical room, your virtual room, whatever that may be, well, the graph just shows up. And something really interesting happens. We're pattern matchers. And so somebody pulls up a graph based on what they, their intuition or what they think may be the problem is they're kind of poking around and feeling the edges out of the problem. Somebody else sees that and says, ah, oh, I have a different idea. And they run a slightly different graph. Somebody else sees that, oh, I have a different idea. They run a slightly different graph. And what ends up happening is the, the, the ability to get to resolution happens so much faster. So much faster. And that's because we now have a shared context and we're collaborating around how to discover and repair, right? This is really cool. So by me querying a couple graphs, I can suddenly like, have the ability and the power to share with everybody, here's what's going on. That VP comes in, don't stop your talk. Run a chat ops command, let him look. Or even better yet, let him run the command. I'm come back to that, just gonna plant that seed there. The second bit is enabling team scaling. Team scaling is huge for chat ops. So one of these things that I like to talk about is the idea of becoming a force multiplier. Right? As technologists, we should be making our job and everybody else around us smarter in any way that we can. We have a specific skill. We have a, something we're good at. And most of us love to share that knowledge. Right? The problem is there's not enough hours in the day to learn everything. There just isn't really isn't. And for those of you who are still trying to meet, reach the mecca of the generalist and system administration, I don't even know how you do it nowadays. Right? There's so much out there. 
So what is, how does ChatOps help with that? Well, what you're able to do is you're able to, ooh, that's the wrong slide. So what you're able to do is you're able to start giving, giving or requesting subject matter experts to go in and codify their own knowledge into chat, codify their knowledge into these chat ops commands, right? And then everybody now has the access to execute these things. So suddenly, the MySQL person who's gone off and created, you know, commonly known tasks, like here's, a, here's how to create a database backup. Normally, I have to call the MySQL guy or gal, wait for them to like, get through their queue of DBA tasks. Maybe they'll back it up for me, and three weeks later, I can actually run the migration that I care about, right? Well, I don't want to do that. I want to run my migration right this second, because this is the deploy time, right? And the DBA has given me the ability to do this by codifying their knowledge into chat ops. Now, I have the ability to run those commands. Same thing can happen on any part of the stack, the networking stack, the application stack, the operations stack, whatever the stack is. As folks start to really leverage chat ops, everybody becomes more powerful. Indirectly, right? Not directly. Indirectly, Every, that power has been codified and everybody gets to leverage it. Now, you know, the, the, you can go through and now read this code. It has now been codified, infrastructure's code, one of those great concepts we've heard here a couple times. And folks can go learn those things on their own time. Or, you know, not, and just use the commands and be powerful. Either is acceptable, really. But by providing that interface and providing that ability, everybody gets to grow. Everybody gets faster. And then safety is a huge thing too, right? You know, I'm, I'm kind of alluding to this idea of giving scary commands to people. And this is okay, because we're using chat ops to make safety, right? I like to bowl with the bumpers up. You ever, you know, bowling with the bumpers? So I hit some pins, right? You know, I, man, I hate losing, right? So you want to hit some pins, right? And that's basically what chat ops starts to allow you to do, is build some build the bumpers into your process, into your workflow, such that the things that you know and have defined that are safe can now be executed by anybody. Well, that's cool. You get to define the boundaries and the parameters, right? We were talking earlier about, um, about features and right, creating interfaces for people to consume. You give everybody all of the options, they're, they're going to run into uh, um, decision fatigue. They're just not going to be able to do anything. But you give them a, some subset of options with some safety around it, people will just go nuts. And we'll start leveraging this. We'll talk some more about this. Also, let's be frank, this is kind of an added by byproduct of chat ops. Um, once a good chat ops program starts establishing, you start being executing these things in the context of chat all the time. And what ends up happening is if you're not a remote company, it starts with suddenly you're not really talking to each other in, in, in work, physically using words. You're chatting at each other. Right? My CEO at Stagstorm kind of made a joke the other day. He says, it's kind of interesting working at a company kind of really heads down like this specifically focusing on things like chat ops. Because he'll be sitting there working, and then all of a sudden, four or five people will just get up and walk out of the door, and he'll just be like, what is going on? Well, they agreed that it's lunchtime, and they went and figured it out, right? But that's the power. And once that happens, well, who cares where you're at at that point? Be on the beach. Go give a talk in Germany, right? It doesn't matter. Your work can get done in the same way as if you were sitting in the physical location with other people. That's pretty cool. Like, I don't know about you, but like, if I'm still working and sitting in an office in 10 years, I'm going to be real sad about the state of things, right? We should be able to go to the beaches and have good times and still get our work done. Okay, so have I got you salivating a little bit about this? Are you excited about this so far? Okay, or maybe I see some smiles. Sto yeah, okay, all right, cool. So let's talk about design. What does it actually mean to build a chat ops program? Number one. You have to keep it small. So I've alluded to this, but chat ops is a huge cultural change, right? And, and I don't like to bring this up lightly, but let's just call a spade a spade. A lot of folks are afraid of automation, what it's going to mean for them, how it's going to affect them, how it's going to affect the bottom line of the company, tons of things around automation that when you come in and say, I'm going to make your life easier, that's not what they hear, right? They hear, you're going to make my job go away, right? Well. So there's that barrier. And in reality, good companies 
uh, good capitalist companies. You know, when you figure out how to decrease the amount of effort associated with growing the business, and you make the, the curve of effort slightly slope downwards, and there's some effort, or, you know, there's some extra space in that graph. Well, it turns out, if you're a good capitalist, you're going to fill that with extra things. And you're going to constantly be fighting this. So nobody ever really goes out of a job unless they were just looking for an excuse, which is here nor there. That's, that's always fun. But really, you got to keep it small. And the reason you keep it small is because it's about slow, specific, mindful change. Create one thing, right? The one thing that you get asked for all of the time. Whatever that may be. I know it's in your head right now. You're thinking about it. And it's one of those non-value-add necessary things that you've got to do in order to keep your job or operations running, whatever that may mean. Maybe it's file malware reports, or create new issues for failures, or something. By creating small things and removing friction, which I'm going to talk about, you get adoption. It also, right, all of these things and keeping them small, you're going to encourage people to go to these. If at any point you create a chat ops command that suddenly introduces more or even the same amount of effort as the previous command, no one is going to use it. Because it's going to be easier for them to leverage their existing knowledge to go use the existing tool than to fight and learn how to do something else. Chat ops commands should be intuitive, should be easy, should be your native language modeled, whatever that means for you so that the folks who use it is just there, and they just consume it, right? We talked, uh, Mitchell said earlier, right, it's the one command. I want to be able to do one command. That's what you want to strive for, right? So now, also, like, how do, we, how do I give these things to folks, right? What does it actually mean to type in a chat ops command, and how do I care about it, right? The first thing is describe the service, and a service doesn't mean Jenkins. A service doesn't mean Travis. A service means your CI build, okay? And your service means the graph, the TSDB. Now, at GitHub, we actually started very early using English language. Go do this thing for me in Travis. Go do this thing for me in this application. Well, that's great until suddenly you need to change the application. And now the behavior is now burnt in to, that it's hard-coded toward that actual application as opposed to the service, right? This is just kind common ops knowledge, right? Well, with chat ops, once you've exposed this thing, as long as the functionality is the same, you can go exchange entire stacks behind it, and nobody will know the difference. Because their interface, through chat, that they don't even need, need a client for. You don't give them any, any uh, other than the actual thing to log into chat, which probably is installed by corporate policy. They have nothing. And their barrier to get started with doing complex things is minimal, very small. Now, why this is important is because this is where Conway's law comes into play. Conway's law tells us that the, the structure of software starts to model the communication structures that we're actually using in real life. And so it's real important to make sure that you're not, you're not shooting yourself in the foot in the future, right? That you're not hard coding these language features into how you model chat ops, right? Because suddenly, if you need to change and you need to pivot, what's going to end up happening is that all this hard coded language that you've codified suddenly inhibits you from changing because now your users are expecting a certain interface, right? So you just have to be real conscious, because the interface that users are having, and not just admins, developers, non-IT personnel, VPs, right? Think about them. Use standard interfaces. This is kind of a relatively simple one. Um, and the reason I just kind of bring this up is because uh, when I see some chat ops implementations, they're kind of all over the place with how you call them and how you parameterize them and how you leverage them in chat. And I say all over the place, these chat ops commands, you know, I've probably seen like four or five actual shops doing chat ops for real. So I don't mean to over exaggerate. But the concept being, again, consistency for your users. The chat client is their UI. Their interface is that little text box where they type commands in. If they have to remember some delta between calling one chat ops command one way and another chat ops command another way, well, again, that's friction. Right? That's more effort that you're having to give to them in order to make this successful. So stick to pick something, whatever that format is, and stick with it. I like the command tree with parameters view of the world. Right? Here's the command I want to run. Here's the subcommand and any attributes that I'm going to pass on to it. 
It's my preference. It's built into StackStorm. I'll allude to that later, too. And this is also a big thing, right? Help comes first. And this is kind of contradictory to pretty much everything that every operations or developer person has ever done, right? Whoever writes documentation first. Nobody's hand went up. You see that, right? Nobody, because it's not fun, it's not enjoy, whatever, whatever the reason it is, right? But this is how discoverability occurs with chat ops. Because to a user, as they're interfacing with the chat ops, as far as they're concerned, it's just another person on the team. And I don't just, like, you know, when I need something from somebody, I go up and ask them a question. Hey, how do I do X? Hey, how do I do Y? Well, that's our behavior, and we should expect that same behavior to be reflected in how we leverage our bot. So I should be able to say, hey, bot, how do I go do X? How do I go do Y? How do I go provision a server? How do I query my graphs? Whatever it may be, it has to be first. So folks know how to consume it, right? And then give it character, right? This is another kind of one of those cultural mind hacks, if you will. Um, Hubot at GitHub is a jerk. I'm just a real jerk. He would insult you randomly. He would, he would, oh my gosh, he would tell you bad things if you typed in commands wrong. Uh, certainly, he'd put, pop in funny jokes from here and time to time, but he had a character. And we knew Hubot was going to be a jerk. Figure out what you want your company's character to be with your bot and give it to it. So when you're typing commands back out about error messages or whatnot, don't put error 304725, you know, missing whatever, or dump the exception into a chat room. Right? Make it human. Give it words that matter to people. Ah, this failed because I screwed up. Right? I the bot. Okay, cool. Well, what does that actually mean? That still is a mind trigger for folks, right? Giving it character so it doesn't feel like a computer. It feels like a member of the team. It feels like somebody who's going to help them and not inhibit them. It feels like somebody who's going to give them power, right? Think about the person who you rely on most for advice. When you go ask them, what do you expect back from them? Codify it. And this is, this is a huge thing. We talked earlier about how do I train new team members? So one of the hidden benefits of chat ops is that we get to leverage this idea that we as humans have been doing for a long time, depending on you know, how long you, you believe the Earth is old. Right? Uh, as long as humans have been around, we give oral tradition to folks. Right? Written text has only been around for so long. And even when we try to write documentation in the IT world, it's out of date the minute you hit save. Right? Out of date. And so all those things that you're shipping around and the playbooks that you're trying to do to keep people up to date about how to do operational tasks, they're out of date. And maintaining them becomes a full-time job. But if you really take the chat ops methodology on and you use a chat client that you're either forcing all history to be in or records all history for you, Onboarding a new employee, or remembering how to do something, or looking for something complex becomes just as easy as searching through the history for somebody else executing the command, which is very similar to kind of oral tradition, remembering how people did things in the past. Right? I don't have to teach somebody, because it, you just say, here's the place to search for it, and it more or less becomes automatic. How did you rerun that command when we had that outage? It's like it comes in bursts. Maybe it's like sun waves? I don't know. Um, but you get these, you, now I can just point them at the history, and they can go in and look and figure out, OK, this is how I go do these things. Right? Onboarding becomes super easy. First day at GitHub, deploy code. Not, not, not figure out what's going on or whatnot. It's deploy a new feature to the website. Totally inconceivably done, unless I had something like this. They just dropped me in front of a terminal and said, see what you can figure out. And you just watch for a little bit. Right? You watch people do operations. And then you kind of see, like, oh, oh, I can do that. And you look through history and see how historically things have done this. And why this is important is because now, all of this work that you have been doing is now brought into these conversations that you're already having. So the context of the work you're already doing is now in line with the actions that you're taking as a result of it. There's not different places of data store for this in an email or ticketing system. It's pretty much a linear view of history, including the commands that were run and the output of that. 
immensely cool for like incident management reports. Uh, um, let's see, trying to figure out, again, training purposes. All of these are hugely just for free a benefit of chat ops. So make sure that when you're implementing this, use a client or a service or put something in that records all of history and make it available to your users. Okay, so basic design. Now let's talk about iteration. And while I do this, I actually kind of want to, I want to see if my demo is going to work. So let's, let's try something here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to provision some new nodes. So we did a demo uh, recently where Rackspace had come up to us and said, we want a chat ops auto scaling. And they left it at that. And we, well, what does that mean? We want a chat ops auto scaling. OK, well, that could mean uh, many things. But for in the context of Rackspace, it means they need to add a DNS. They need to add some load balancer. They need to add create new nodes. They need to add the DNS for those things into um, uh, into the DNS records, all these things, right? And they needed to happen with one command, right? And they had, all they had was an API available to us. And so we took it and we said, let's go create a new autoscale group. Uh, what are we at? OSDC. Right? You type in a command, and then suddenly things start to happen. Right? The bot receives this command, figures out what needs to occur as a result of it, goes and starts to provision some new nodes, and the, all the while tells you about the status of these things. There we go. Right? So now the bot's got some command and is going to go do all these things. So while this is happening, we're going to go back to our talk, talk about iteration, and we'll come back to this. Okay? So right now what's happening is a bunch of things are being created. Very excited about this. So now let's talk about iteration. Um, we talked about building small things, right? Start small. Even micro to that, build passive things, right? Your first job should not be give the ability to delete a MySQL server to anybody, right? Or delete, delete. Just, just remove that word from your vocabulary for very early on, right? Give passive tasks to people. Let people get used to the idea of consuming information from chat. Open tickets in your ticket base. Open alerts in your alerting base, right? Commonly go search for logs from your Splunk cluster or your Logstash cluster. Go get graphs. Go do something passive and something where they can get information. You'll do this a couple times, and folks will start to say, OK, cool. This bot is useful to me because I ask it for things. And so the day we'll actually go do things for them, they'll just, their mind will be blown. Right. Oh, this thing that just told me information, like the weather, is now suddenly provisioning entire auto-scaling groups. Cool. Okay. So we talked about these, like open tickets, query alerting issues, acknowledge alerts is a good one, query data, whatever. Right. Passive tasks. Don't give anything destructive day one, day 30, whatever that may mean for you. You'll pretty much feel, you'll get a feel for your users as they start to actually consume this, that it's time, time to start introducing destructive tasks. Okay. But start small. Now, why this is really cool is now you're building these small tasks. You're going to start like accumulating these things, right? The auto scaling tasks, the go create new services, go go uh, change BGP routes, whatever that may mean. All of these are consuming and it come up with some amount of small primitives. Create a VM, create a DNS, set up, create a new load balancer, whatever these may mean for you. These primitives start to add up. So don't build giant workflows that go do massive tasks. Build very small tasks. Think Unix methodology. Very small things, do one thing really well, and chain them together. So these primitives then become consumable by other folks. Right? This is key. This is part of the collaboration. You want other folks who are building upon chat ops to consume and use your chat ops. Kind of meta there. But if you make it too complicated and too overloaded with special edge cases and whatnot, Again, folks who you want to consume it or develop against it, they're not going to. So build small primitives around self-service tasks. Provision a server, query log, deploy an application, whatever that may mean. The end state should be these things, but the things that you create, the actions that you create, small primitives. Okay. Shepherd your subject matter experts, also another one. Right? Your subject matter experts aren't going to know how to write for this thing or even how to do this thing because it's not their job. 
or whatever their excuse may be. But you want that knowledge out of their head so that everybody else consume it, can consume it. That means you, as the folk who wants to try to help and make cultural change, need to like, actually put in the effort to say, here's what it means to consume chat ops. How can I help you help me? Right? Help you help me. And help them along that path. Here's how to create a good chat ops command. Here's what success looks like. Here's what I can actually use from you. If you could do these five things for me in your domain, in networking or SQL or application or whatever that may mean, if you did those things, it would make my life tremendously easier. Go help them do this. Right? Shepherd the subject matter experts. And this is also key. Never explain, just do it. Somebody's going to come up to you and you're going to have chat ops commands. And they're going to say, hey, Bob, Bob, of course, everybody's Bob. Hey, Bob, I need you to go create a new user for me. And instead of saying, hey, you can, you know, you could type this command in, and then it would do it for you, just do it. Cool. Well, what happens is they see that, and they go, ah, cool. And they just pretty much ignore it. Thank you for creating that account for me. I'm going to go off into my, do my thing. And inevitably, they're going to come back, and they're going to say, hey, can you create an account for me? And you're going to say, yep, and you do it again, and again. And again, and it's going to take a little bit of time. But eventually, you're going to come up and say, hey, you know, Bob, I notice that every time that I say, hey, can you get a new user, you type this command in. Can, do, do you think I could do that? Yes, yes, do it. Do it right now, and do it right in front of them, right? And let them do it, right? The knowledge and power, right? Give that self-empowerment. You're trying to give them back the power, which means they need to take it. But you have to show them how to do it. Don't tell them. Show them. Show them how to be successful. And they'll grab it. Right? It also helps with the adaptation. You're not shoving something down their throats. Suddenly, they just see that your job is made easier by talking to this bot. They're going to come up to you and say, hey, can the bot do things for me? Yes, it can. How can I help you? Then you, sub you shepherd them, you help them, build the primitives, and then everybody gets the power. And these are the mind hacks you have to play. Because right? these are cultural changes you're making. Right? All these are focused around communication around the tools. All of these tools that you have in your environment, they're focused around the human interactions and communications associated with executing these commands in the shared context of the chat room. So, you know, I'm sure you're thinking, like, there's, there's got to be some problems with this. Why? why is it that the four people in this room who have, never, who have heard of chat ops, why aren't they doing it? Right? Well, there are some pitfalls. They're, they just are, right? You've got to be aware of them. So let me see if I can answer a few of them before we get too far, and then certainly ask some more. Confidence. Guarantee you're going to run into it, right? People are not going to have confidence in what you're doing. People aren't going to have confidence in this bot. People aren't going to have confidence in automation. Whatever that may mean, right? I like to tell the story that there's a standard bell curve of people when it comes to technology. There's going to be some amount, 10 to 20% on this far end that are always going to get it, that are always going to be on the upper curve, that are always going to want to be on that bleeding edge. On the back end of that, there's 10 to 20% of folks that will never want to do it. For whatever reason, it doesn't even matter, they will never be on your side. Just going to you know, it's, you know, the person came to your mind right away, right? Then there's everybody else. And this is like the big 60 to 70% of people that are just kind of watching trying to figure out what's happening. So you have to build confidence by doing things according to your culture, right? You're going to get a feel for how and when people will accept new commands, right? You drop the first command that's passive in, and people start consuming it. And then you drop the second command that's passive, and people start consuming it. If you go too fast and you introduce too much change, you will get rebellion. You will get folks not having confidence in your automation solution. You will get folks, you want to start building upon this and creating even more complex workflows. Well, ChatOps also helps with this too. Because those primitives you've been creating are now being executed in the context of ChatOps, hopefully, all day, every day, by all of your users. And so those primitives, they get battle tested. Is it going to work? Where are the edge cases? You're going to be able to program those things out and figure out what makes sense for you. So when you go to start building those really strong and complex workflows and somebody says, you know, I'm not sure if that's going to work, you can basically point to all of the primitives in the list that, com that comprises this workflow and say, look, all of these do, and their failure rate is 0.2%. I'm pretty sure chained together, they're going to work. 
you build confidence, right? Build confidence. <laughs> the second one is slow uptake, right? It's going to feel slow as molasses as you do this, right? Again, this is a cultural change. It's not a technology change. You're introducing a technology, but at core, it's a cultural change. And so you might get upset, you might get frustrated that folks aren't using my awesome new chat ops interface. No one's querying commands through my chat room. Why am I the only one doing this, right? It, give it time, it will happen, right? This is also a good time to enlist your first follower, right? So the first follower concept is, is as soon as the first follower occurs, m people will see that happening, be okay with it, and start going. Find your advocates within your organization and make them followers, right? Focus on them, shepherding them into this concept of chat ops, right? And help them go be advocates for you, right? Don't be the only person saying this is awesome. But be okay and be aware that it's going to take some time. And this is the big one, access control. So suddenly I'm giving all of these really complex commands to, I don't know, everybody in the organization or everybody who has access to this chat room. That sounds like a fantastic idea, doesn't it? Um, this is actually kind of a problem. Now, I'll be frank with you. Uh, Lita and Ur fundamentally do not have prop solutions to this. You're basically anything you give to those chat, chat bots, you're going to cross your fingers and you're going to either have to write some middle layer yourself in order to do access control or be okay with the concept of giving access to everybody. You know, my experiences in Germany say it's the latter, not the former. I'm glad you guys are security conscious, right? So keep that in mind. Hubot has uh, a roles pattern where you can like delineate who has access to run certain commands. So it gets you some basic level of access control, but it doesn't tie in with any of your heavy hitting like actual repositories of access, you know, like LDAP, right? Um, this is actually a problem that Stackstorm's trying to solve. So Stackstorm wants to sit on top of all of these tools, your Hubot, your Lita, and your Ur, and provide that layer of access control. So we're not done with it yet. We're heavily working on it. But you got to care about this, right? You don't want everybody to say, delete everything. When you go to start introduce delete commands, maybe you only want to do it to a subset of users, right? But be aware of that, right? Be aware that access control is a thing. Do your research and figure out what works for you. Right? It may be that it's okay to start out with a completely open system because your beta internally is only going to be a handful of people anyway. Right? But keep that in mind as you're building. It's going to come up. And then acceleration is the kind of last phase of this thing. Right? Uh, basically, the idea here is now that you've got chat ops, you can start to do the real big things. Okay? So let's advance in time a little bit. We've, we've now have chat ops, we've got it in our organization, everybody's loving it. Now it's time to really start advancing it, right? Because it turns out chat is just a different kind of bus, right? It's just a much slower bus, has a lot of latency because there's humans associated with it. But in the concept, the event being emitted from your chat client into some system to take an action is basically event-driven operations. An event occurs, I want this thing to occur, I have asked the bot to do it, the bot goes and does something, event done. But this is where you get to start create feedback loops. Okay? So you have some action, you've done this, and normally at the end you just celebrate and go get a beer. Well, after, as you're going and getting a beer, tell the bot, here's what to do with this data that now that it's come in, and here are the extra actions I want to have associated with it. Don't just be okay with creating the ticket. Create the ticket, notify somebody through pager duty, uh, actually do the destructive action that's necessary, whatever that means. Start creating your feedback loops. Because now that you've built confidence in your chat ops system, people are used to this bot dropping into your room and just doing random things. Hey guy, hey Bob, I just rebooted this server, just so you know. Hey Bob, I just changed our BGP route. Cool, people will get used to this, the bot coming in and dropping knowledge on them because they've been consuming data. Then they've been using it to make their lives better through self-service. So it's not that big of a jump to get to the point where you actually want to be where the bot is doing everything. That's where I want to be. I really don't want to work. I want to go to a, be a beach, I want to drink some beer, and I want to be happy, right? I hope all of you want something similar to that. But in order to do that, we actually have to get hardcore with the automations, right? And that means as soon as you teach the bot to do something, try to teach it how to be reactive. Right? Another thing Stackstorm's trying to solve, trying not to pimp Stackstorm too much, we're big on workflow, 
right? So as, after you have an action, something workflow needs to happen after that in order to execute. Ah, this one event happened, I need to go actually do 30 more things. How are you going to do that? Create the feedback loops. So real quick, uh, since we've done this, let's, let's look at our demo. How am I doing on time? Doing okay on time? So here's our history, right? So we did some chat ops command, and I asked the bot, hey, go create a new auto-scaling group for me. And it said, hey, no problem. I'll go create a new auto-scaling group. I'll create a new load balancer. I'll create a new DNS zone. Here's some new knowns. Whiner unavoidably. Oh, that's so good. I have this random name generator for my nodes, and sometimes it comes up with the best. <laughs> that's so great. Uh, created a new node, added to DNS, adds it to the load balancer, and all I had to do was continue to talk to you and work was happening in the back end, right? The power of this comes when you give this to your VP or CEO and he does this or she does this because that's what happens. We have our CEO going to investors going, check out how powerful I can be and type in a command from his phone and this stuff happens. That's real power. Okay, now let's talk about some other real world examples. I've got a couple. There is a colleague of mine, his name is James White. He is, subscribes to the concept of the lazy administrator. He is the laziest administrator I've ever met. And that doesn't mean he sits and does nothing. It means he works his butt off in order to get to the point where he can sit and do nothing. Now, that never, the nothing never happens, but you know, it's a good goal, right? And so one day, he's sitting around in his chat room and he's got CSRs non-technical personnel coming in and saying, hey, I need to know some information about these printers that we're selling as a service. Th these printers needed to know whether they were up, whether they had appropriate supplies. They were basically printing credit cards, and they developed a service where they sent this little box to a bank, and instead of waiting the obligatory three to five days to get a new card when you lose it or create a new account, they just printed you one right there. Pretty cool. But these CSRs would always come in and say, hey, what's the status of this? What's the status of this? What's the status of this? Well. Going back to these concepts, these fundamentals about design and iteration, he went through his history and took a look at the different ways people asked him the question. And he said it came out to be about nine ways they asked the same question. And he codified it in chat ops. And then one day when they dropped into the room and they asked, hey James, what is the status of blah? The bot answered and they went, huh. And he never had to answer that question again. You're, that's power though right, is now those CSRs are no longer encumbered by the IT department. They're actually accelerated by it because they're able to leverage the technology that the business is using to make their business better and it's not a burden to them. It is frictionless. They're able to consume. Super powerful. Another story. Uh, this one happened at GitHub. Uh, my colleague Mark Embriaco was on his way to Velocity to speak about chat ops because, you know, it's a real powerful concept. And on the way, he gets a phone call, says, dude, we're under a DDoS, YOLO, <laughs> right? So, you know, normally, as the incident commander, you get a call like that, everything stops. You're going to stop whatever you're doing. If you're in a taxi, you're ripping a phone out, computer out, whatever that means. It's all hands on deck. He pulled out his phone, typed in one command, and put his phone away. And what happened was, called other people that were on call just to let them know that this thing had happened, notified their upstream providers, initiated a BGP change, created and started an incident log to track what was happening, track performance metrics, all that, you know, what was going on, and dump them into chat every so often. All of this happened from his phone in one command. BGP routes entirely changed. You tell a network person that, and they're going to flip out. You're going to let a bot touch my BGP routes? No, thank you. Yes, thank you. Please. Right? Because now, my power, I don't have to wait for the NetOps guy to get on the phone call so we can mitigate this DDoS because we're losing dollars a second. I type the command in, and the power that's been codified is now mine to leverage. He doesn't get woken up at 3 a.m. in the morning. I get to go to sleep faster. All, everybody wins. Everybody wins. So let's talk about going further, right? This is not just an operations thing. You're thinking, I know and I hope that you're thinking about how you make your day-to-day -day life and your team member's life better by doing this. But remember, this is not just an operations thing. You're introducing a cultural change and you can and should extend it further than your immediate boundary. Include the business. Because remember, DevOps is a business problem. It's not a technology problem. As much as we talk about the tools, DevOps fundamentally at core is a business problem. 
How do you make sure that the efforts that we're putting in are actually providing real-world value to the business? Because it's one thing to sit in the corner and go, oh, look at my cool CoreOS cluster. It's, one, it's another thing to go, look at this cool CoreOS cluster that's serving hundreds of thousands of requests, and my CEO can operate it. Whoa. Right? Two totally fundamental things. And you have to build this confidence, right? We've talked about this over and over and over again. Confidence matters when building chat ops commands. So that's really much more all I have to say about it. Um, I mean, not generally. I have a lot to say about this. Uh, if you're interested in talking more about it, I really do love talking about it. Most everywhere online, I'm known as Jay Fryman, including Twitter. Uh, and if you have this email thing, which is you know this old archaic thing, send me a note. I'm more than happy to talk to you about it. And we're also on IRC, right? So I hang out in StackStorm channel all the time. We are literally trying to solve this problem. How do you make chat ops accessible to the masses, easy to consume, and paired with workflow, right? We're not taking over your tools, we just want to enhance them. So if you're interested in learning more about that, head to our website, learn more about it, and I'm always happy to talk about it. So with that, thank you very much for inviting me. Any questions? I hope maybe it was that good. Yes, Kelsey. Sure. Absolutely, right? So there are some of those, right? You're going to get noisy chat rooms and noisy access. So for the most part, you, there's two ways to associate this, right? Or a couple ways. Way number one is you start to split out your rooms that are bot traffic versus human traffic. So at some point, that actually does matter, right? You're going to have you know, chat clients that can open multiple panes at a time so that the, the log stays relatively in history, but there's so much happening with the bot that you need to know that the, the communication channels differ a little bit. Uh, the other way to do that is to leverage some sort of paste bin service, right? Where instead of like letting the chat client expand those things, you just drop the link in there. And if the chat client expands it, well, that's really on the user. You've at least provided some sort of shortening place where that data actually cares about, some S3 bucket, some internal GitHub server, whatever that may be, in order to make sure that that doesn't flood your channel. Um, there's probably other ways, right? Uh, but we've seen the scale pretty big, right? Beyond you know tens of users into the hundreds and thousands of users. So um, Really, again, kind of falling back to Conway's law, it's about how your communication structures are, are, happen. So if you find yourself being encumbered by the, the noise, it, you know, you'll find a pretty clear way to split out. Yes, sir. Yeah. You create the frictionless necessity for them to be in one room over the other. You limit the chat commands that would be important to that conversation to specific rooms. So you're forcing them, like you're introducing a slight amount of friction, that friction being you have to be in this place to talk about it. But that's the most amount of friction you introduce. You execute this command in one chat room, it says, hey, you really should be in this room. I'll go do it, but I'm not going to tell you about it. Or I'm not even going to do this, go execute it in this other room so everybody else can see it. Yes? Uh, currently, um, on, pardon me, on the core, no, it's not feasible, right? So a Hubot command or a Lita command or ur command is transactional, right? As soon as that transaction is done, it doesn't really have any state or knowledge of the conversation you're having. Um, I can say on the stacks, stacks. Stackstorm, this is the company I support. Stackstorm side, we actually do have kind of a concept of state storage, so you can maintain some amount of state around a person or a conversation. So you can do challenge response or things like that. Like, hey, you want to execute this really complex command? Why don't you confirm that for me? Stuff like that. Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, I, I just realized I'm not repeating the, the questions, I'm sorry. So uh, the question was, how do you not get distracted? Why does that matter? You've accelerated their work by providing commands to be faster. Let them slack. That's a reward. Like, I think, I think it's important from a cultural perspective to have things in that make work fun. Chat ops makes work fun, and it even accelerates work. So it becomes okay to get to a point where you drop a silly cat photo in because it's really hard and you're really stressed right now. 
Well, that's okay. Like, slack off a little bit, right? Don't be so stressed. They're just computers, right? And so that's the point I want to convey is I don't think there will always be some amount of people going to slack off and, and interface with the bot, right? But that's not a bot problem. That's more of an HR problem. But in general, I actually do believe that it's important to, like, introduce that fun and let that occur. Let the encourage kind of laziness because it'll encourage them to put things into chat ops so they can be lazy. That makes any sense. Yes, sir. I don't know. Like, that's a good question. I don't think I've ever run into the problem where somebody doesn't want to be seen doing chat ops work, right? Like, most of the things that are exposed via chat ops are things that need to be collaborated and communicated about anyway. We're going to have these conversations. The command just supplements those things. Um, you know, I, the way I would solve that, if there were a concern about that, is there are commands that I want to be transparent, right? And this is actually a bit in StackStorm that we care about, because we do know this, right? There are some commands that are going to be limited to a channel or even limited to a user. Um, is making it so that commands that need to be exposed are exposed, and then commands that don't need to be, I can just have private conversations with the bot with. So, like, it's a different way to approach it. Flip the bit a little bit, right? Make it so that the things are explicitly defined. Here's what I care about, and the other stuff, whatever. Go talk to the bot in your corner if you want to. Um, another good way is like you know having some channel where the bot just hangs out where I can go give garbage to it. I don't know how to use the bot. I don't want to be embarrassed like trying to ask the bot questions in the in the common room where operations is happening. Go to the bot room. Talk to the bot. Yeah. What else? All right. So I hope you got 2,500 euro worth of information out today. And if you didn't, again, find me. Thanks so much.